We're going to go right into the Division Two scene for tonight, guys. And I think uh, we'll stay in the MIAA, actually, to start. This time, number 11, Emporia State, taking on unranked Northwest Missouri. The Bearcats have only lost once to the Hornets in almost 30 years. That was last year, 2023. Braden Gleason and company, they took down the Bearcats in what was a pretty historic matchup. This time, though... Bearcats getting their revenge 14 to 9 in a relatively low scoring affair for both these squads. At the half, it was 9 to 7 Emporia. And we've seen this Emporia team explode offensively through the first couple weeks of the season. A big key here, and as we roll through the tape, what you'll notice Gunnar Gundy not in the picture for this Hornet squad. He ended up exiting this game with an injury. So certainly those signs are hilarious, by the way. Love those guys showing up. He ended up exiting this game with an injury. So certainly hoping that he is all right and can pull through. One, because you don't want to see guys go down like that. Two, because he happens to be very good at throwing a football um, and just in general. But some key plays here. You look at that one right there. Hands above the head, the referee, Emporia State. They get the safety that ended up being a pretty timely type score and uh, kind of just determine some of the pacing of this first half. But Northwest unwavered, even though they uh, were down two at the end of the first, the game winning score actually came with 11 minutes left in the fourth from uh, Chris Runke to Luke Matthews on a 29 yard touchdown pass. That touchdown, the only score of the second half for either team. Here you see another quarterback hit in, in, uh, in replacement of Gundy with a great breakup in the end zone from that Bearcat defense. And they stepped up early and often in this matchup. Chris Runke did still have a day, I will tell you that. 20 for 36, 244, a touchdown. But what you don't see, I guess, right off the rip, Runke with four interceptions on the day for Northwest. That allowed this ESU team to stick in it. So when uh, Gunnar Gundy goes out of the game, which, by the way, he had 20 pass attempts, only completed six of them before ultimately leaving, had a touchdown and interception. This Northwest team did a great job of limiting him even when he was at full health and still active in this game. If you're Northwest, you're able to go and have this type of quality win against a, a top 15 type opponent and throw four interceptions... That is something that's uh, that's really incredible. It's family weekend down there in, uh, in Missouri. So they got to host this one. But a big time win for the Bearcats. And, and after a down year for this Northwest squad, to see them bounce back kind of in the, in the way they have. They're 3-2 and two right now. Their two losses being that season opener to Mankato. And then uh, right after that to Nebraska, Kearney. They have really bounced back, man, and have played some really good ball. You beat a Fort Hayes team that was top 25. You go on the road and absolutely blank Missouri Southern. Now you pick up a big time win versus Emporia. The next two games... I mean the next all of them. But the next two games are at Washburn and at Central Oklahoma. What can this Bearcat team do on the road to kind of solidify their place inside of the MIAA? But we'll move over from the MIAA. Let's go over and talk about some GMAC action. Ashland and Tiffin facing off in, some, in a game that has a lot of GMAC title implications. Shout out to Greg Wilson on YouTube for these clips. And uh, this one... The Eagles back and forth, I think, for the start of this year. Tiffin, the reigning GMAC champions, a lot on the line here for both sides. And I guess I'll just I'll leave it at that. Ashland takes this one 21 to 12. It's no secret. They actually went to halftime up 14 to 3. And you'll notice here they had some big plays going on early. How about a fourth and seven conversion for the Eagles? What a great way to get things going in the first. I love those chrome helmets from Tiffin, though. That is a, that is a really good look. Uh, but when you look at this, Ashland scores, uh, and this is the fake punt, by the way, on the fourth and seven. Take a look at this. Step up, looked like he was going for the pass, and then steps up and actually takes it himself. Runs right into three defenders. How about the fourth down quarterback for the Eagles? Little bit of trickery here. Reverse flea flicker. Downfield vertical shot. Got him wide open, and that would be the first score of the day for the Eagles. Just under six minutes to go in the first quarter. That puts them up seven to nothing. Tiffin would answer uh, in the second quarter with a field goal, but then Ashland bounced back again. They go into halftime up 14 to three. Close this thing out 21 to 12. And 
You talk about this defense making plays. Tiffin's defense has been one we've talked about quite a bit. Uh, they were not able to limit Ashland, I guess, nearly as much as we expected. Jamari Kroom, three catches for 125 and two touchdowns. Have a day over there at Ashland. That is a big-time stat line for the Eagles. Jalen Thomas was a leading receiver for Tiffin with 116 yards on 10 catches of his own. Ashland defense does step up. Colin Strong has a takeaway through the air, an interception, a couple sacks from the likes of Jeffrey Barnett. How about a couple of guys like Bryson Getz uh, and Jane, Zane, excuse me, Zane Swackhammer, uh, both getting back there into the backfield. There's the next touchdown from Ashland. And, uh, I mean, you could not talk about a more timely statement win for this Eagles offense and just this Eagles team in general. Right now, they sit at 2-2. Two and two. You start the year off 0-2, oh but the great thing about where they're at right now, those two wins are both conference wins. You open up at Hillsdale, as far as GMAC play is concerned, you win by three. Now you pick up a massive win over this Tiffin squad. You're 2-0 and oh in conference play. Everything is still very much ahead of you when it comes to winning a great Midwest uh, Conference championship and some other things when it comes to a playoff berth and those type of deals. So Ashland's still very much in the driver's seat here. They lost to uh, Indiana, Pennsylvania, IUP more more known as, and a tough loss against Ferris. Now you look down the road at home for homecoming versus Ohio Dominican. Then you go on the road for Finley, Thomas Moore. You got Northwood still on the schedule. Some some games for sure for Ashland still moving forward. This feels like a game that looking back maybe four weeks from now, a month from now, that uh, we could say this had a lot of implications for that GMAC championship. Here is an attempted field goal from Tiffin that Ashland actually does get a paw on or a claw on. Is that more appropriate? That's That was bad. Sorry, that was bad. <laughs> but um, nonetheless, no puns. No puns about it. This was a massive win for that Ashland squad. Uh, excited to see what they do moving forward. Let's go over to the NSIC. Minnesota State Moore had a team that we've been talking a lot about on this show as of late. They take care of business. They beat number 18, Augustana, 43-41, to the home team. Their first win over the Vikings since 2017. How about that one? I'm all, always here for first. 24-24 to at halftime. Into the third is where uh, Minnesota State Moore had separated themselves a little bit. But this game was back and forth. There was no... Uh, this was very much a slugfest, right? What you'll notice, though, Gunnar Hensley from Augustana, three interceptions on the day. That's a big piece of what they had going on. Per usual, we like to play this game here on DU1 Rejects. How many yards did Minnesota State Moore had run for? I'll tell you right now. We're, we're going to play the game together here, right? So it looks like they had 474 net yards of offense. Doing quick math here. So we'll play the game. I wish I had the Jeopardy music. I don't. How many of those yards were rushing yards? If you said anything other than negative one, you would be wrong. <laughs> Minnesota State Moorhead continues to go out in a maze. Jack Strand is certainly a dude when it comes to that regard and being able to get these results. He finishes 47 of 67 with 475 and five touchdowns, one interception through the air. His arm might fall off. It won't. He's a stud. But uh, it's pretty incredible what he's able to do on a week-in, week-out type basis. The thing, the play that actually clinches it, though, not off the hands of Jack Strand. It is off the hands of Cody Sorensen, the game ceiling interception for Moorhead, as I show it here. Across the middle, you see that Moorhead side go up. Super pumped there for that result. The drop back across the middle tipped looked like it was tipped off the receiver's hands he goes up grabs it that would be the game ceiling type of play there for this dragons team really excited for them i love watching them play ball simple as that huh big time win over there on the nsic for moorhead and uh when you look we talk about strand this feels like a rather important number Holy cow. Jack Strand leads the Dragons in all-time passing yards with an astonishing 7,691 career passing yards. That is admirable. That is entirely admirable. And we talk about a team, too, that there's no surprise factor with what they have going on. Their opponents know exactly what's going to hit them, and you cannot stop it. That's what makes this number all the more impressive and incredible. So shout out to Jack. Shout out to that Moorhead offense, that Moorhead staff, and everything they got going on. 
over there. Let's go over to the NE10, a conference we don't talk about too much here on this particular program. This has the potential to be the best game of the year inside of that conference, that being New Haven visiting Bentley for a game that actually determined the NE10 championship just a year ago. A lot of people, including myself, would say that probably will have the same implications this year. You see early New Haven as a 7 to nothing lead, Bentley knocking on the door, and uh, like I said, very likely to determine the... Uh, NE10 champion once again. Bentley going down into the end zone. Back left corner. Great pitch and catch. They'd even things up in the first. As I pull up uh, some more of the box score here that I can get some more information. But this one was definitely a much anticipated matchup for both these squads. Like they know. Teams talk about not marking games in the calendar. That's a bunch of baloney. Like this happens uh, for a lot of these teams. The first quarter was full of touchdowns. After the first, New Haven led it 21 to 14. Went to halftime, actually knotted up at 21 apiece. And then New Haven did end up uh, separating themselves, excuse me, when it got into the second half. Uh, a big part of that was an interception in the third quarter. Uh, Bentley, that certainly led to that in a, in a certain way. How about a fumble also in the fourth quarter from Bentley and a couple late turnovers on downs. This touchdown feels like a rather momentous type of play for that New Haven squad in almost like the color rush, like mustard bottle type uniforms we got going on over here. Pretty sweet. Uh, looking at some of the breakdowns though individually, you look at uh, this New Haven offense, and you can't talk about it without talking about the man in the backfield. Christopher Eyes, I'm hopefully pronouncing that one correctly. 28 carries, 238 yards, and two touchdowns, averaging almost nine yards per carry. That's an incredible stat line. Uh, Brett Pullman for Bentley under center, 27 to 50 with four 57 and four touchdowns. Did have the one interception I mentioned earlier. This game was uh, a lot of offensive firepower on display. Some defenses stepping up to make some timely plays uh, on both sides, but some really good things happening for both these teams. Rashawn Bradford for Bentley, seven catches, 197 and three touchdowns. That feels like a rather noteworthy stat line for these guys. So, Big time win for the Chargers. You look ahead now at their schedule, kind of heading through the rest of, excuse me, any 10 play. They're 2-0 in conference play now. American International, Southern Connecticut State. Really right now, you look at this schedule, October 26th at Assumption. That feels like, for me, looking forward, the only team that could potentially stop this Chargers attack. I've been wrong before. I will be wrong again. But right now, I'd have to say, if they win and take care of business October 26th, this is a New Haven team that will once again clinch the NE10. And, you know, for better or worse, will be part of the playoff conversation. They've been uh, in those talks before, but uh, who knows? Maybe this is the year where they actually do make some noise in the postseason if you're, a, if you're a Charger fan over there. But let's keep moving along as far as D2 is concerned. Back to the MIAA. Nebraska Kearney, they take on now number 12, Central Missouri. Central Missouri uh, rebounding absolutely. Coming off that tough loss to UCO, they go down and they win by one point against the talented Davenport team, Guess what, folks? They did it again. They won by one point again. They got to stop doing this shit. Uh, for people and fans of this program, it's got to be uh, pretty tough to watch here. But uh, this one, shout out to uh, KSNB Local 4 for the video here that I'm using. Second week in a row that UCM just barely squeaks out a win. 36 to 35 over the Lopers. And uh, this one kind of a tale of two halves. UCM leads 27 to 7. Going into the half, they were outscored 28 to 9 in the second half. The low offense uh, really got things going. And uh, this one, it didn't really necessarily come down to absolutely the wire. Uh, the game winning touchdown was about six minutes left. Uh, Zabrowski finds Michael Fitzgerald in the back of the end zone. You'll see some highlights here as I roll it. Uh, but the, kind of another back and forth type matchup, and one where UCM had to step up at, uh, at different, different points along the way. Now, uh, let's see here. There was a field goal attempt with uh, in the fourth fourth quarter here. I'm trying to think here. Oh, no, I got the, I got the box score a little missed up here. But um, anyways, UCM pulls out that win, uh, a big-time win for them, and a lot of stuff going on through the air. 526 yards for Zach Zabrowski through the air. He attempted to pass 69 times. That's incredible. Five touchdowns, two interceptions, the reigning Harlan Hill winner. His receiving core had quite the day, obviously, as you would expect. Zach Patterson, uh, Jack Pospisil. 
uh, leading the way with six and ten catches, respectively. Uh, Nani Davis, nine catches for 83 yards. Had four different, five different players, excuse me, with receiving touchdowns for this UCM offense. That feels like a really impressive statistic. Had some defenders that stepped up as well. Uh, Rajon Williams gets the interception in the defensive backfield. And uh, a couple other guys had some standout performances. How about David Lilly for that Kearney side? Interception, 11 tackles, and a tackle for loss. Uh, Jameer Jones had 18 tackles for the Lopers on the day. That's pretty impressive. So, uh, Central Missouri, the thing you got to think about, they're getting these quality wins. It's interesting to see how whether it's like the D2Football.com people or the AFCA, like the coaches poll, it's interesting to see how much they weigh in, like the not the quality of wins, but the uh, the margin of victory, right? Is it more important to get the W in the win column or is it more important to blow a team out? And that's something that I think different people weigh differently, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how they do that moving forward. I think the most important stat for this UCM team, especially in a league like the MIAA where we know the, the caliber of competition is very high, you just got to keep winning games. And they are certainly doing that. Let's keep moving forward. Back into the NSIC we go. Sioux Falls making a visit to Minot State, who we've been very high on, very excited about the Beavers. They have now eclipsed the most wins for the Beavers in their D2 era. I do believe that's like 20-plus years that this team uh, has been doing this. So Minot State picks up the win in this one, 26-21, rebounding off of a, uh, a tough loss uh, to Mankato last week. And let's be honest, they got they got kind of throttled last week. So for them to come out and get this result this week and be able to bounce back after what was, I'm sure, pretty much a letdown uh, for this Minot offense and kind of a team in general, this was the scene post game for that Beaver squad inside the locker room. Hashtag Waddle is one of the cooler things uh, in college football. I'm sure it's an acronym for something. Off the top of my head, I do not know what it is. I apologize to you, Beavers. Uh, but that's a pretty cool thing. That is the scene from the locker room. Minot State got it done. Sioux Falls actually led 16-14 to 14 at the half, but uh, Minot did a great job of spreading the ball out here. A lot of different contributors when it came to their ground game. Um you know, going down the list, they had four different guys with 10-plus carries spreading the thing out, three touchdowns on the ground through the day, only two catches through the air, which, I mean, does that surprise you at all? No. Uh, Brayon Augustin, two breakups on defense, not too many crazy other stat lines. This game was very back and forth, very physical kind of uh, NSIC matchup that we've kind of come to be familiar with. Against the Sioux Falls team, it's had a hot start to the year. I don't want to diminish their opponent at all. The Sioux Falls team has certainly looked solid. Camden Dean, 17 for 24, 166 and three touchdowns. Incredibly efficient through the air for this. Uh, I do believe they're the Panthers, right? They're the Panthers squad. So another big t a big time win for Minot. Excuse me. Excited to see them follow through and move forward this season. Let's go on to some CIAA action, a conference that maybe does not get as much love on this show. We're going to talk about a couple teams, actually, uh, in the CIAA today. The first matchup we'll talk about, Virginia State taking on Fayetteville State. This one turned out to be, I think, pretty interesting. Virginia State, the Trojans take this 35-18, to much in part to plays like this. That deep connection got things going uh, for this squad, and this is a Fayetteville State team that uh, took the CIAA last year and I do believe was undefeated inside of conference play, right? So that, I think that kind of tells you all you need to know about they, what, what they had going on here. Uh, they actually opened up the scoring, but Virginia State would answer, and uh, going into the half... Virginia State led 21 to 10. Really in command of this. Their defense, you see it here, stepping up, getting back to the quarterback, making some of those, excuse me, some of those big time plays defensively. Um, offensively, we saw two different quarterbacks get a lot of snaps uh, for the Broncos, I do believe. Uh, that would be Damari Daniels, 6 for 15, 107, and a touchdown. And then uh, Joe Owens Jr. with 11 of 20 for 104 and a touchdown and a pick. So some split reps there for that Broncos squad. What the constant was throughout this game is pressure on the quarterback. You see them getting it done. And some big special teams plays here, too, as we get going on the punt return for the Trojans coming up the left side of the field. A little cutback action, get things going for them offensively. That was a big part of their offensive success as well. Kevin Gales, three receptions for 149 yards and three touchdowns. You heard that right. Every time this dude caught the ball, it ended up with six points. That is awesome. That is so sweet. Uh, but anyways, moving forward, 
Some standouts on defense. Talk about the defensive pressure. Uh, Virginia State had four different guys register sacks. We've seen, I think, almost all of them already. Alex White, Ahmad Poole, Jay Sean Alston, and uh, Mustafa Coley. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that one correctly. They all got into the backfield, were very disruptive defensively. And then, of course, K.J. McNeil did have the one takeaway through the air for the Trojans. So big time plays for this Virginia State squad. A lot of things still going on here uh, when it comes to CIAA play. When you look at their schedule, they're sitting at 2-2 two and two right now, and you think, well, who are those two losses to? One of them is to D1 Norfolk State. That was lost by one score. The next one was actually their opener, Winston-Salem State. That was uh, just a week ago, or two weeks ago, I should say now. They lost by one point, and now... This is really going to be the big-time test for them. We're going to talk about Johnson C. Smith here in a little bit. This game at Johnson C. Smith for Virginia State is going to determine a lot when it comes to CIAA uh, seeding or uh, placement, I should say, depending on the division of what you're kind of looking at there. But big-time win for them nonetheless. Let's go over to a top-ranked out-of-conference matchup, the GLIAC starts conference play as well as the Gulf South maybe a little bit later than other conferences. Grand Valley State, number two in the country, playing host to number 21 in the state, West Florida. And I actually had the privilege of sitting down and watching this game from start to finish. First of all, I was thoroughly entertained. Like, this was just a very good football game. Grand Valley State, very much still a talented squad. West Florida certainly showed flashes, but I think the MVP of this one, I mean, this Grand Valley defense, you see Eichelberger here getting things going for the Lakers. This Grand Valley defense, though, is as disruptive as they come. And I think what's so important about that is usually that means the front seven. You see it here, our guy Gilchrist getting back there. I think that's Niles King with him, who also is very disruptive off the edge. He was doing a lot early on for the Lakers. Having this man back in the lineup, Avery Moore, an absolute unit at the quarterback position helps for sure. But this Grand Valley State defense is disruptive from the front four to the front seven. Even their DBs are coming up. They are downhill type players that are not afraid to lay the wood at all. Uh, some big time playmakers in that back end for sure that make plays in the run game, but also in the pass game. This game was a tale of two halves, right? When you look at the box score in this one, I need to uh, pull it up here real quickly. But after the first half, this was not something where you thought GV necessarily was going to run away with it. They led 14 to 7. And it felt like GV was dominating, but the scoreboard didn't necessarily reflect that. Into the second half, though, is where they bust the thing open. In the third quarter, GV outscores the Argonauts 17 to nothing. After that, I mean, there was even there was no scores in the fourth quarter, and a really tough day for Marcus Stokes, 10 for 27, 102 yards and two interceptions. I don't think that's of too much fault of his own. Obviously, you know, you want your quarterback to step up in these kind of situations, but man, he was running for his life back there. Like watching that game, that's a tough spot for a quarterback to be in. Avery Moore being back for this offense really helps. Khalil Eichelberger, big time game on the ground. Avery Moore also getting it done with his legs. Kyle not with some more circus catches for this GVSU offense, but let's talk about this defense. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven different Lakers registering sacks on the day for GVSU. There is nothing better as a defense than being able to disrupt the quarterback. The rest of the things fall into place. Ian Canelli with a pick through the air. Jason Hardy with another takeaway for this GVSU defense. They were all over the place. And again, that's what separates these elite level teams. You talk about teams like Grand Valley and Harding, which hopefully we get a rematch of them in you know eight, nine weeks, whatever that looks like. Those are teams that control the pace of play, have an incredible defense that can stemmy I mean stymie any kind of offense, and are just physical and dominate the line of scrimmage. These are the teams that we've come to see that have really won out in division two. So excited to see how that rolls out. Finally, one more game that I wanted to make sure to highlight. And one that we've posted quite a bit about on our socials. That being the Cardinals from Saginaw Valley State. They are playing host to... Uh, I don't know, it's not playing host to, excuse me. I, think, I believe they were uh, they were at Indy. Sorry. They were at Indy. Um, they take home the win against the number 15 team in the country. 28-24. to The Cardinals get it done. After what was actually not the, uh, not the quickest of starts. They were outscored 17-7 in the first quarter and uh, they got outrushed in the day, but really it was the takeaways defensively that had things going for them. Two takeaways returned for 80 yards total. Feels like a really important kind of statistic. And uh, 
Man, this box score is uh, incredibly hard to uh, to follow. But uh, Elijah Gordon, Leonard Henry for Saginaw, both stepping up nine and eight tackles respectively for those two. Uh, the Saginaw Valley State squad, who you know coming off. In the last couple of weeks, a tough loss to Northwood in a rivalry game, that Axe Bowl there. They have responded in a great fashion, and now they open up GLIAC play at Northern uh, this next week, so expect them to probably continue that success. Uh, uh, some really good things for Saginaw here. I think the biggest thing is consistency, right? How do you level out and take some of these really good performances? Uh, not to say a terrible performance, but before, but uh, kind of mediocre performance. How do you find that happy medium? How do you make that more consistent for the Saginaw Valley State squad? But certainly wanted to highlight that Saginaw getting the job done. Their second half, they outscored UND 21 to 7 and uh, improved to 2 and 1 on the year. So, really excited for that Saginaw squad. Now, quick hitters. To close off the D2 conversation, how about Schoen snapping a 13-game losing skid with a 27-25 win over Mississippi College? <laughs> Things you love to see. Add that to the list. Frostburg State, they take down newly FCS Mercyhurst, 25-24. Lock Haven picks up a win on homecoming thanks to a fourth-quarter comeback over Millersville. Love to see that. Coach Mulrooney and gang down there, the Bald Eagles. And then you got Finley coming out as a GMAC favorite, potentially, question mark, after a 28-21 uh, win over Hillsdale. Feels like Finley will definitely be in the conversation there. Northwood still has a lot to say when it comes to conference play over there. Tiffin, Ashland, the usual suspects. The GMAC has a lot of parity this year. Harding is very good at football. They beat number 20 Henderson State 66 to nothing. I, guys, I don't know what else to say. And like people sometimes get upset because they don't talk about like the Hardings, the North Centrals, the these teams that are like number one and like just dominating week in and week out. What do you want me to say about this? This is outrageous. This is not supposed to happen. This is not your run-of-the-mill team. This is Henderson State. The Reddies are a top 25 team in the country, and it feels like every time Braden Jay got the ball in his damn hands, it went into the end zone. And then they come out on defense and they do this. They take it away from Henderson State. They go down and they score again. And then guess what? Henderson State gets the ball again. Boom! You're sacked on your own three-yard line. This Harding team is suffocating. They're suffocating on offense because of guys like this that do freaky shit in the open field and get down and score touchdowns. Then they come on defense and they're absolutely suffocating. Their defensive line is incredible. Their linebackers fly around and make plays. Their defensive secondary is no slouch. They still have a guy in the middle. If you, in case you forgot about him, I don't know how you would. Uh, Blake Dela Cruz, if you're still very much that dude, you got a quarterback in Keylon that's been running that system for a while. This team is terrifying. Look at the open field speed here again. I don't know what to tell you guys. And I do realize I just said I was at a loss for words and I went on like a little bit of a rant. So that was entirely hypocritical of me. And, and just when it feels like Henderson State is getting some hope, swatted away that kick. This Harding squad, it feels like they're going to go on another magical run. I am excited to hopefully be there and try and see them in person at some point throughout this year when hopefully when it comes to the playoffs and these games are really starting to stack up. But um, shout out to Harding. Still very much getting things done over there in Searcy, Arkansas. Finally, though, we'll close things off on the D2 side with a team that we haven't talked about too much. Johnson C. Smith. They're in the top 25 poll for the first time ever in a 5-0 start. Shout out to the Bulls over there. Wanted to make sure I got that in here uh, because I definitely do uh, respect what they have going on. But that's it for me for the D2 scene.